I'm here with Kyle Forster, the uh, co-founder of Big Switch Networks uh, at Interop 2011. And uh, Kyle, uh, why don't you uh, get started by introducing yourself and talk a little bit about Big Switch Networks and what you're um, going to be showing at, this, at the show this year. Sure. Yeah. So at the show, we're primarily participating in the, uh, in the Interop Lab, OpenFlow Lab itself. Right, in that, in, you know, there's a booth with over 13 vendors that are all participating, I think, very much in the original spirit of Interop and, uh, you know, a large-scale interoperability demo. Uh, we're participating in that. We're participating in another demo where we're showing some of the, uh, some of the parts of our platform. And then we're actually helping a series of our partners with their own demos. The, uh, so it's a, it's a pretty exciting, you know, it's an exciting spot for us because suddenly we're, you know, we're not only... You know, for us starting to to come out of stealth mode here and talk more and more about what we're doing, but just as much we're seeing a whole series of partners, and there's a lot of equipment in that lab that for us is actually quite exciting because it, I think the world is just about to see the breadth of engineering initiatives that are going on around OpenFlow across the industry. Um, the, uh, there's far more engineering being done here than press releases, so you can see it sort of all together in the in the racks in this uh, in the interop lab. It's neat to see. Yeah, and I think it's an exciting time, and you know, from my perspective, one of the big things that's changed right now, um, there's been initiatives to try and open uh, the the world of networking to, to more uh, competitive model to uh, application development ecosystem and so on, and a lot of the initiatives in the past have failed. And what I, I kind of think is is part of the reason why OpenFlow is being so successful now is that we're reaching a time where the application developers and the the, the cloud providers are starting to realize that, hey, now our applications really need to be able to talk to the network and interact more with the network and mobility inside of the cloud. We see it with Hadoop and, and the, the cloud controllers and things of that nature. And, and so I think um, it's no longer Cisco making these decisions. We have uh, application developers and the rest of the ecosystem really taking a lot more active role. Do you see that as, as um, being a big piece? Yeah, you know, I think they're, you're right, I'm trying to, evolve the networking industry from the mainframe type of model to something that looks like more like the service model. But th this is not a new concept. Right? This has been tried before. But there are two things that are different. Now, let me actually say three things that are different. Uh, the first is the maturity in the set of technologies right? in networking the, the rise of broadly available networking silicon. Uh, Third party available silicon is a fundamentally kind of changes the industry landscape in one direction. Uh, the emergence of open flow as a technology standard changes the, changes a bit. So there's this kind of a series of technology trends here that I think are very interesting. Uh, there's a series of large-scale market landscape trends, right, as a number of vendors try to figure out how to compete against Cisco's entry into the server market. The, the landscape there is changing and changing on us very fast. So that creates you know, an industry dynamic that we've never seen before. But I think that you hit on what I think is the really most important piece, and that's the these things are happening in an area where requirements for a network are actually changing. The, you know, certainly in the data center side, you know, we see you know the emergence of fat tree architectures to support to do. We see the emergence of virtual machines and VM mobility and the rapid roll on roll off of VMs. This, you know, a server no longer being tied to a switch port fundamentally breaks some very deep mental models around networking. Mm -hmm. And this is changing the requirements for what a network has to do. You know, even on the campus land side, we actually see, you know, in one of our, one of the beta customers that we're working with, um, the exact same size networking team, today has double the number of devices that they had on their network compared to three years ago. And the vast majority of those have non-traditional operating systems. You know, these are not only these sort of uh, mobile phones and iPads, but these is, you know. These devices include HVAC equipment, PCI compliant, you know, credit card swipers, mm -hmm. security cameras. So the, you know, the explosion of these devices, each of which have their own security needs, their own compliance needs, even on the campus land, is changing the requirements for network. So you know, these three things: different technologies being available, these long-term technology trends, uh, a, you know, a huge amount of chaos in the industry landscape among the very, very large IT vendors. And the third part is just changing requirements. We think it's really going to change the uh, it changes the dynamics of a networking conversation, and it allows the emergence for really new, really big technologies. And we think that OpenFlow could be one of those. Yeah, and it, it seems from the momentum. I mean, one of the things that's, that is, I think, surprised everybody um, is here we have a technology that 
frankly, you know, even among networking experts, if I go talk to, they may have heard of it. Mm -hmm. They may know what it is, they may not, um, and that's across the board. And, and all of a sudden, you know, almost out of nowhere, and how long has ONF uh, been, been uh, uh, formalized. <laughs> it's, About four weeks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 barely off the board, and we already have the who's who of everybody in the industry on board in uh, in ONF, and it's it's blindsiding people, right? I, and um, one of the things that I think is an interesting impact is is. Uh, Juniper talking about Q Fabric, and we've got Brocade talking about VDX, both of whom were saying that hey, Trill and 802.1AQ already, even though they haven't even final been finalized and, and what have you, they're already insufficient. Mm -hmm. And so OpenFlow can take a, a, di a different perspective rather than looking at, a, a, say, a Trill or, or a um, 802.1AQ yeah. perspective on. And can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. About how OpenFlow addresses the, the networking uh, sure. as, as an alternative to Trill or DCB? The, um, or not DCB, excuse me, the 802.1AQ. 802.1AQ. The, uh, you know, I think you can take two, two paths there, right? The first path <coughs> is to say that um, the OpenFlow protocol itself is expressive enough that we can write applications that if what you really want is exactly Trill, this can be actually implemented on top of an OpenFlow architecture. If what you want is the benefits of Trill, so i.e. multipath forwarding, I'd point out that I don't know a single open flow you know, vendor today that's pushing an architecture that uses spanning tree. Well, it's not part of the protocol. I think of it as part of the architecture. So there's the protocol, which is very tightly defined. There's the architecture, which is sort of the final bill of materials around a set of products that really all come together and do something, right? which is by nature much, much richer, much more complicated, much more loosely defined. But I don't know a single architecture out there that's using spanning tree. So even just out of the gates with these architectures, we're actually quite a bit farther ahead uh, in addressing some of the kind of the data center multipath concerns that something like Trail or AQ would, consider, or would go after. Uh, just by virtue of the technical architecture makes this a much easier problem to solve with centralized control plane. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's become the state of the art quite quickly. And if somebody does an open floor architecture that involves spanning tree, my guess is that's it's not going to be competitive. So I have a, um, a, a question for your thoughts. Uh, if we talked a little bit about virtualization. And um, there's this, this idea of, of um, how we've traditionally applied network policy. So as the access layers eroded and turned into the viewmore switch, I found that most enterprises aren't even applying network policy anymore. And the, the traditional models of doing so are just not feasible in, in a dynamic uh, environment. So I can't, when I'm getting a new application, I can't go read, turn to page 3000 of the manual, figure out what ports it's going to be using, find out the IP addresses. Mm -hmm. Those are all dynamic. It's too, way too much work up front. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I can't write quality service or, or security based on access lists, based on IP addresses as, as in a dynamic environment. Yeah. It doesn't scale as we look towards the future. How do you see uh, OpenFlow being able to address that type of challenge? So it's a, it's a great point because I think of some of the really some of the data center customers that I'm, that I'm talking to today, enterprise data centers. Mm -hmm. And we see, you know, if I just look at meetings from the last six weeks, you know, I see folks in two directions, right? There's one direction that says, I want, you know, I've always had a highly locked down data center. I have a lot of security needs. I have a lot of compliance needs. Uh, so I need, you know, Apple's all the way to get server. You know, this is, this is how I'm going to run. And that worked up until last year when we started rolling out VMware. It's yeah. usually where that con conversation ends. I had a great conversation with a, with a group that said, look, every time we roll out a new server, I lose a member of the networking team for two, two days. Right, just update, basically updating me last night. You know, we used to roll out a new, a new server every eight to ten weeks. So it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, painful, but we could manage it. Mm -hmm. Thanks to server virtualization, we actually roll out a new VM every two weeks. And so every two weeks, I'm losing somebody for two days. But that's a completely unacceptable drag. So, you know, there are folks that kind of sit in this 